Hello everybody and welcome to All Blaze No Glory, the podcast. Um, this is a podcast that I'm going to look back in the last two weeks of Scotland men's performance in the Six Nations and try and make some sense of it all. Um, as a Scotland fan who's been watching Scotland and supporting them sort of for last 20, 30 years, um, this last two weeks have been the strangest <laughs> in terms of emotion for me. Um and the start with the Wales game, it took 22 years for us to win at Wales uh, in Cardiff. I know we won in Swansea, but let's not count that. But it, it took 22 uh, years to win again in Principality or Millennium Stadium, whatever you want to call it. And it felt it made you feel kind of empty as a Scotland fan because it was so bad uh, the, last, the last 38 minutes. And then, of course, the loss to France, it felt like, we had the game there to win and somehow managed to lose. Also really stings. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Wales game first because actually it's the easiest one to analyse in terms of or to talk about because there's not really one thing that, <laughs> that led to Scotland being in such a bad position um, towards the end of that game. Um, I'm also going to talk about how they were a little bit lucky as well. Um, so... Obviously, Scotland uh, Scotland started off and it was one of the best first halves of Scotland in terms of dominance, in terms of game control that I've ever seen. Like, I don't think anybody at that point in Welsh, you know, even the the truest of true Welsh supporters thought that they had any chance of coming back. But somehow they did. Um, and I can't really put my finger on when... The tide completely turned. I do think they made they went to their bench early. I don't think um, Townsend responded in kind uh, early enough. I think that we got a few things wrong in terms of the balance of the squad um, that were maybe masked by how dominant we were. And when Wales started to get a little bit more structure, we we completely went to pot. Um, I think really where it, for me what was wrong with that was that you had forty two minutes where. When when Duhan scored that try in the forty second minute, because after after the first half, I was like, I don't feel comfortable, and then Duhan scored that try, and I was like, yeah, I feel pretty comfortable now that we're gonna we're gonna win this game, um, and yeah, sure they might score, but um, there's you know it's, we're we're gonna get the bonus point, we're gonna win this game pretty comfortably, and uh, we could start emptying the bench now, and you know, or pretty soon, and and giving players caps and what have you, um, it didn't go like that though. Uh, I think there was some, uh, there's a few folk I follow on Twitter and they were getting annoyed at Ben O'Keefe and I do think Ben O'Keefe got a little bit sympathetic towards Wales in terms of the 50-50 calls started going Wales' way and I think that's natural as a ref sometimes when you know one team is completely um, doing over the other team uh, is to sort of be a little bit more sympathetic when you see a 50-50 where you know, Scotland are maybe slightly offside um, and you wouldn't normally give it, but you're like, oh, they're offside, I'm going to give that. and it, it sort of balances the game. I think with O'Keefe, certainly some of the things that he'd done, I, I, like, you know, I was like, that is quite soft. Like the Turner, the first penalty that was just before the Wales first try where Turner was um, not rolling away, um, I'd seen him er earlier in the game shout, oh, well, the ball's there, or you're holding him in. And you could see Turner was, like, aghast um, at that penalty. Um, the the mall penalty, I think, 100% was correct, actually. I, I think um, we're lucky he didn't give a penalty try, although my understanding of the rules is that if you only give a penalty try where they don't score a try, um, and I, I'm not in, or the laws, sorry, I, I don't think that necessarily, and I respect Nigel Owens, that that's right, because I've seen so many times where someone has went over in the corner and it could have been a penalty try and the ref's given the try. Um, so I do think that maybe that was the right call because they definitely scored. Um, I think what was wrong with this after that was it, we were all out of sorts and we didn't really think about you know managing the game at that point. And we went and kicked the ball off. We gave them. We gave away another quick penalty. They um they then scored in the corner, and then you're like, right, okay, twenty seven twelve. Now I'm starting to panic, really big style, because, you know, at twenty seven five, that's the type of thing that Ireland would concede a try against the run of play and a yellow card, and then they would just manage to close the game out, and manage the game, keep the ball down their half. We didn't seem to do that. We tried to run it out from our own half. We just 
it just wasn't good and um, players weren't listening to the ref even if he was wrong in their eyes um, and were getting frustrated with the ref and, and what have you. I'm going to come back to a couple of players though that people got on that I thought was a bit unfair. People were getting on Jamie Ritchie. Jamie Ritchie I think was penalised maybe once in the game um, and people got on to Tua Pelota who was definitely only penalised once in the game. There were players that were far worse um, that weren't listening to the ref. I mean, in fact, at one point I saw Jamie Ritchie go for what looked like a jackal that was in a, t- a clean jackal attempt, and the ref said, hands away, and he lifted his hands up. So I don't think that... I think people were just sort of clutching at straws here. They've got this thing about Jamie Ritchie with refs, but then after the game people were saying, oh, Finn Russell's not very good with refs. And I think it's just people, like, we just can't take that sometimes we're a bit crap. Um, and sometimes that we screw up and sometimes we do insane things that make us look like chumps um, as a Scotland squad uh, and yeah I think we just need to as a like as a, a rugby watching fan group accept that sometimes we're just a bit naff and it's not let's not scapegoat one individual player or whatever because the the, the moans that we had about Jimmy Ritchie's captaincy we've all, I've already heard about <laughs> put Finn Russell's captaincy and I think Finn Russell I don't think he was any problem with the ref um, and Jamie Ritchie's reputation came from an incident where we got marched back 10 that Luke Pierce apologised for after the game um, so you know folk are just kind of clutching at straws with things we weren't good as a collective we were disorganised we didn't get the ball and keep it we um, guess the referee was definitely sympathetic towards them um, he let them away with something, um, in my opinion, that, you know, there was a high shot by Cameron Redpath, and I do think that that potentially was a penalty to Wales, and it could have won the game for them. But right before that, not only was there a high shot on Luke Crosby, which was missed, bec- and it was a high shot because the player's arm was back, and he, so it was tucked. It was not a wrapping motion. Like, when Crosby hit the Welsh 10 in the head, at Costello, um, he was rapping and he slid up his old man that he was he was he was driving forward. So there was no penalty. There was no foul play. I think it was it was the Welsh prop that had his arm tucked back, and went shoulder first into Crosby's head. That to me is at least a yellow card. I know that Crosby was bending. He was being tackled by someone else. But he's not he's not legal to begin with. So it is a penalty. Um, it, 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 he didn't call that but right immediately after that he didn't call Adam Beard essentially tackling our nine whilst in an offside position who didn't even have the ball there were three penalties there one tackling without the ball one being offside and one playing when you're on the deck because Skinner was uh, funnily enough um, penalised for tackling whilst on the ground as well so I do think O'Keefe started to get a little bit kind of like Oh, it's all it's all Scotland that are playing dirty here or, or being penalised, and not Wales. Because if we had got that penalty, then Cameron Redpath never makes that questionable tackle, and nobody from Wales is moaning about it. Ball's in the corner, and Scotland maybe even get a try. If they don't get a try, they maybe settle the game down and play the game in their half. It, it, it's it's it, it's kind of a little bit annoying that um that sometimes there's these just these little butterfly effect moments that that you know everybody talks about it. and it's the same with the France game and I'll come on to that and um, I think to be honest we need to just not focus on the Welsh game we managed to win the Welsh game and in terms of the championship if everyone had said to you you're going to get one point win in Cardiff for the first time in 22 years before the game excluding the manner of it you would have taken it um, I would have certainly taken it because we've not we've not beaten Wales um, away from home for so long and even when Wales have been absolutely terrible we've went there and laid an egg. So it was good to get the win. Um, and I think there was some changes that were required after that. I, I do think that the back row changes that Tony made going into the French game were good. I think perhaps they didn't go far enough. Um, and I'll, we'll get on to that. Um, and I do think that we, we, we looked more structured against France. And then when we played France, um, to be honest with you, I, I thought, to be to be honest, we would get a bit of a French backlash. I think we, we dealt with the French and we marshaled them pretty well. I mean, I saw people say, well, it's a French B team. 
I mean, they were missing Dupont. Yeah, so it wasn't really a French B team. They were missing Dupont. Um, I know they had a couple others missing through injury, but, but, but so did Scotland. I mean, that's international sport. Um, and I think, you know, all in all, that was a pretty decent French side on paper um, that we were playing. Uh, I think, for me, the problem was we weren't ruthless enough. Um, we didn't build scoreboard pressure. Um, and there was key moments in the game where we made really stupid decisions uh, that, you know, we'll, that we live to regret. Now, I'm going to come to the... I'm going to start with the thing that's obviously on everyone's mind, the referee in, okay? I actually thought Nick Berry had a pretty good game, or he certainly had a game that didn't affect us um, in the way that he has when we've played, say, Ireland. Um, maybe because we've learned that when Nick Berry's refereeing, you can get away with a lot more at Rucks. Maybe because um, it just the French aren't the same as the Irish at Rucks, so they don't challenge us the same, I don't know. But certainly Nick Berry um, had less of an impact, I would say, on our gameplay than normal. We didn't look stifled like we have done when we've had him as a ref before. And I think that was a testament to the boys stepping up and learning from their mistakes in Cardiff in terms of uh, not listening to refs because you could tell that there was times where they were going for the ball. And I mean, I was watching it live in the stadium. I've watched the highlights. I'm not sure I've got the strength to watch the game again, but um, you could sort of see that when he was saying, like, to take a step, everyone was taking a step, or like, hands away, people were lifting their hands out of things they thought were legitimate. Um, so he didn't stifle us. Um, I don't think Berry was the reason that we lost. Um, I know that we're going to we'll come on to the TMO decision then, I guess, now, is that's the point to do it. The TMO decision, for me, there was, there were several things that were wrong. First and foremost, as much as I've praised Berry there and said he didn't affect the game for us or he didn't stifle us, he should have been head in quickly and then going, no, balls down. Okay? He, 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 we've seen it with Roman Poit where we all went mental. I mean, I certainly did. When he put his head it clean in the ruck or in the pile of bodies and then came out about 20 seconds later with his arm in the air. And we all went mental as Scotland fans for that. And I think it's just like a consistency of like the effort by refs to look at things. And he was in a good position. He should have got his head in or got closer and had a quick look and went, right, that ball's down, it's a try. Um, you know, even if he'd blown it and just went, TMO, my own field decision's a try, it's different. Um, if he'd said try or no try, but I don't think they're allowed to do that anymore. So um, we're, we're in a position where he is given no try. Now, I obviously was in the stadium, so I was not privy to the TMO slash Nick Berry discussion over the comms. However, from what I've heard um, and what I've seen, Nick Berry was all for changing his decision and accepted that the ball was on the ground until the TMO called him back. And I don't know whether the TMO saw Olive on behind Nick Berry and thought, goodness, I'm... Um, not going to be able to get through Paris alive again or whatever. Um, but you can't do that. You can't say, yes, you should change your decision and then say, no, you shouldn't change your decision. You've, you've got to have the power of your conviction. Now, if you'd said no, it's not conclusive in the first place. I don't think everyone on, on and Scottish fans are kicking off the way they are. They might be still annoyed that it wasn't a try, but... It wasn't given, but I think the fact that you gave it and you've said that you're going to uh, overturn it, to then turn around and say, I'm not going to overturn it, is ridiculous. Like, it, it, it's, it looks amateur. And either what World Rugby needs to do is go, we're not going to have the comms play out over the TV. We're not going to have referees having big discussions. They're going to go under a hood like they do in the NFL. And then they're going to come out and give their decision. Or, World Rugby says, once you have made a call, you can't change it. So once you, the TMO's looked at it and you went, oh, I should overturn my decision, that's it. There's no further discussion. The TMO cannot chime back in. Because the TMO has actually stitched up Nick Berry there um, in a big way. Because a lot of people complain about Nick Berry. It's not just Scotland fans. 
and they complain about him being a bit kind of, I don't know, rogue, right? The guy has made the decision. He's then said, well, okay, yep, now that I see that, that should be a try. The TMO says yes, from what I've heard, and then they come back to it. And he says, no, actually, wait a minute, we better have one more look. So they have one more look. Oh, I've lost the angle on it. It's not conclusive anymore. Eh? How did you do that? Like, how did you come up with, uh, oh, it was, it, you should be overturning your decision to, oh, I've lost the angle on it. It doesn't look good. There are people that will start spinning weird conspiracy theories about how the TMO was Irish. I don't think Ireland are looking at us and saying, well, if Scotland get to us with four wins, I'm petrified we might not win the championship. I'm being perfectly honest with you. I think Ireland are looking at this saying, Scotland get to us with four wins. It'll be hilarious to make everyone cry. Because the the truth of the story is, is we've not been that good. <laughs> so these wild conspiracy theories that the TMO done it because he's Irish and he somehow wants to help the IRFU make sure that we don't get a Grand Slam, it's outrageous. <laughs> but... The fact that the TMO um, brings it back comes across ridiculous. And then you've got pundits like Bigger saying it's good for the tournament and stuff. Bigger's an idiot. Like Bigger's been like sort of the biggest moan I can think of in a long time. He talked about the draw being fair and all this stuff. The guy's a the guy's an idiot, right? He, he's, he seems like, I'm sure he's a nice guy when he's not talking rugby. When he's talking rugby, he's an idiot, okay? Um, and... The, the, the truth is that, that it would have been good for the tournament to give the try. Okay, so if you're looking at the, from the corporates, that it would have been better for the tournament to give the try and hope that Scotland then beat England and now Italy and went into Ireland 4 from 4 against a team that's presumably going to be 4 from 4 and it was a Grand Slam decider. It's now not going to be a Grand Slam decider and there's every chance that Ireland are going to have won the championship before we even get to the last week. So it's not good for the tournament. So everyone that's casting this conspiracy theory that that somehow is why the try wasn't given because it's better for fans to have a win and all this stuff, give your head a shake. That is not the case. The case is that Scotland um, were unlucky with the TMO decision. The TMO stitched up the ref in a sense and the way they had their conversation was one where it was like they didn't know what they were doing. Um, I think that's it took so long and it shouldn't have taken that long. If they'd given the no try pretty quickly, then I think we, less people would be annoyed about it. But they, they, they said they were going to change it and then didn't. And that's where the problem. Um, we do need to look into technology. Um, if we're going to have a, a rule where the ball has to touch the ground, there needs to be some kind of technology. I don't know. We'll leave that to people that know science to see if that could happen. That would be helpful. Um but if someone said you could see blades of glass above the the bottom of the ball, which meant it had touched the ground. Um, anyway, that is not the reason that we lost the game. The, the, the TMO decision is not the reason we lost the game. People then came on to, well, Penno knocked the ball on, and um, that led to scrum, which led to their try. I'm going to tell you something. That didn't lose us the game. Um, the, kick, the kick tennis stuff... Uh, I think it was right that we were managing the game. We were actually winning the territorial battle. We were forcing, uh, sorry, we were forcing um, uh, mistakes from the French. And that was a mistake that the ref didn't pick up on. He said the ball went backwards, which it definitely didn't. Um, but we still need to accept the situation we're in and deal with it. And... What actually led to that scrum wasn't Pennell knocking the ball on and then the ball being kicked forward. What led to that scrum was Finn Russell booting the ball straight into Pierre Schumann, who's in front of him, instead of either diving on the ball or getting Schumann to go down on the ball. Um, so don't blame, um, don't blame the ref for that. You know, the ref was miles away from it. He's got if assistant refs who could have called it too. They didn't call it. And you're, you know, unlucky. But we still need to react to what's going on. Um, so I, whilst I personally think um, it, it was disappointing, that refereeing decision, 
Um, I, do, I don't think it cost us a game. There's another refereeing decision that I could turn to that actually probably affected us more. And that was the um, the decision um, about the tackling the player in the air when Scott Cummins won the, the, the turnover and we all cheered and we thought, oh, we're getting the ball back with you know a point down. I actually think Berry definitely got that wrong because if you watch Cummins' hand hits the ball and then he kind of the two arms come together. So he, arguably the French player's tackling him in the air at the same time. Um, he's entitled to go for that ball and I think that was, I think this is something that World Rugby needs to have a clear directive on. If you have the ball, if you take the ball then and your arms come together, then that is not, that's not the old Grant Gilchrist like grabbing an arm from behind business or jumping on their back on the way down business that he, he's done several times for Edinburgh. That is clear. I'm getting the ball. He's not even looking at the player's arm. He attaches the ball and the two arms come together. They didn't even have, they didn't even flop or anything. There was no danger in it. And I think that was a wrong decision by Berry that, that cost us points. Um, however, and the French, I suppose, have a right to to have a, a, a grievance about this. There was also the break by Fiku that... Johan made the tackle, and um, I, didn't, I mean, I've not seen the replay of it. Um, without watching the game back, I'm not sure I will. Um, but he sort of put his hand on his shoulder and brought him down, and he didn't even look at that. Um, and arguably, that would have been something that... So that tackle, first and foremost, was one that, as far as I can tell, it wasn't a penalty, because he just put his hand on his shoulder, which is not a penalty. Um then they were saying he was offside. He definitely wasn't offside. There was no offside line created. And then someone's pointed out that um, uh, Bill Barry was uh, was pushed uh, in the in running up, so overran the ball. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't see that, but I mean there was so there's so much marshalling goes on off the ball now that come on, uh, give yourself peace. Um, so yeah, I mean there's all little referees decisions throughout the game. I think the one the reason the TMO thing is so big is because we we decided to leave it until minute 80 uh, to, to do anything about it um, I'm also and I, I'm not 100% sure but it looked like in the stadium clock that it was about 79.58 or something that we actually went over the line at so I um, do wonder if we should have had the restart for that but you know at the end of the day again what we're going to do we're going to punt out the field and not much chance Um. I think the the problem we had is in Scotland was a lot of dumb mistakes in decision making. Yes, the kick tennis was good, but we didn't build any score pressure. We were in control of the game, but we were in a position where one play from France could lead to to them going ahead, um, and we never built the scoreboard pressure. And the, part of this turns right to the end of the first half. Um, because right at the end of the first half, um, we it, when it was about it was about thirty six minutes, um, Antonio gets yellow carded. 36, 37 minutes, he gets yellow carded, and I understand why we took a scrum immediately because it then meant that they had to take one of their faster boys off to bring one of those chunky, uh, prop forwards on, um, and that would mean that there was more space. However, when we didn't score off of that, we should have taken a three. Um, because there's always a risk with scrums, and I, and I would love to see analytics on it. There's always a risk with scrums of just referees going rogue and penalising the team that's going forward because they don't know what they're doing. And like Nick Berry, quite clearly, has never been in a scrum in his life, in his playing days. He has no idea what's going on in there. He's been given a manual, but he doesn't have a clue. Um, and he gives a penalty to France, and then they kick it out, and that's the end of the half. If we'd went into the sheds at that point, it would have been sixteen ten. Then we got our penalty. It would have been nineteen ten. And I know you're going to say, "Well, they got ten points. What difference would that have made?" In that last ditch attempt at the line, they then have to defend with a bit more discipline because they're worried if they give a penalty away, if they come offside, if they dive in, they are worried that they give a penalty and that gives Scotland three points and they win the game. Um. Equally, at some other points, we might have had the chance to go for goal. Um, it, it's we we don't seem to we seem to have this tendency of just turning down threes, uh, and that was a gimme three, 
at the time the, the second penalty came in, I think there was less than a minute on the clock, so we'd have definitely went in. We wouldn't have had to take a restart. We definitely went into the to the changing rooms, sixteen ten up, um, and then as I say, we'd have went. You know, assuming the second the second half went exactly as it was up to that point, we'd have went and got our, we'd have went and got another penalty and made it nineteen ten, um, and then when France scored and scored again, we'd only been a point behind, which meant a penalty, drop goal, whatever. I mean, you could have arguably, and when they got their penalty and we were kicking off again, brought on Healy um, for someone, you know, who is is good at dropping a goal. And then France are worrying about that and they're, they're thinking, oh God, we got to bust out the line to get that. Maybe we get a penalty off it and we, we, we kick the, penalty, the three and we, you know, there's different ways we could have won that game. Um, and it wasn't the referee. It shouldn't have been down to that last play. Um, Yes, I'm angry about it, and two things can be true. Like you can be cross that the the officials made a mistake. Um, I wanted to come up to just the level of mistake as well, because someone said on Twitter that it's been argued that that's a worse mistake than Juber made. Um, and the Juber mistake hurt so much because of when it was and what game it was and and all the rest of it. The Juber mistake was not as bad as that because. Here have the benefit of the TMO. It was bucketing down the rain. Um, he couldn't go to the TMO for that, even though he was incorrect. Um, so I, you know, as much I think what annoyed me more about <laughs> Chuber was the fact that at the end of the game he like ran off into the sheds without shaking anyone's hand, knowing that he'd made a mistake probably by that point. Um, so yeah, I think I think. We can now sort of maybe we'll never forget Juber, but we can can now say that that was worse um, as a refereeing decision because you had multiple angles. You also had the TMO and Nick Berry come to a consensus they were going to overturn it and give the try only for Nick Berry and the TMO to be top well for Nick Berry to be topped out of it essentially. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we need to be better. We talk about game management, and I think Scotland are doing this thing now where they're able to sort of kick, find space, turn the teams, f uh, force mistakes. But we now need to be better at understanding uh, when we need to go for it. And if we just stop playing in the second half because France weren't really challenging us until a beautiful individual try. Uh, put them ahead, and and then obviously there was the follow up penalty. It was, it, you know, it was never safe. And to think six points you're going to close out with twenty two minutes, just ridiculous. Um, so Scotland need to regroup. They now are going to play England, who I would say um are a very beatable side from having watched the you know bits of their their first two games, um at home. They need to come away with a win there. Uh, and, you know, as a Scots fan, I think it would be nice to win something. So even if we didn't win the championship, it would be nice to go into Ireland with a chance of a triple crown. And I can't see us beating Ireland in, in Ireland. But, you know, stranger things have happened. If we can go in there with a bit of, bit of a confidence and swagger, a nice win against England... Uh, a good solid performance of you know putting Italy to the sword. And Italy are good, but we need to be able to like put teams that are beneath us uh, to the sword. I think we go into Ireland with a little bit of confidence, and don't play into their hands. Um, and I, I think we could we could maybe come away with with the triple crown. Um, which as a Scotsman we've not won the triple crown, um, since I think nineteen ninety. So it would be. It would be pretty incredible. I'd take it. I'd actually right now take it. I don't really. If someone said you can have a triple crown, you can't have the championship. I'd take it a hundred percent. Um. So yeah, I want to talk about just a few individual players that I thought. Um, like a, a few players that I think maybe pulled away and a few didn't. I was going to do rankings, but I think that'd be tedious to listen to like me talk about twenty odd players. Um. I think our front row was okay. Uh. I'm still dubious about our hooker position. I'm I'm not sure we're picking the best hookers. Uh, I think it's maybe I get that Cherry's older and maybe you're looking to the future, but equally, 
again, this whole like, oh, well, we're looking to the future for the next World Cup. We ain't going to win the next World Cup, probably. But we have a chance of winning a Six Nations now. So why don't we focus on that? And if we have to use older players, we use older players. Um, I think Cherry could settle things down a bit um, at Hooker uh, in terms of like the the arrows and stuff. George Turner wasn't so bad in this game. He was pretty bad in the Welsh game. And then latterly, um, Ashman was uh, atrocious um, in the Welsh game. In terms of uh, the uh, you know the arrows, so we need to we need to get that sorted out. Um, I actually think the two props that we've got, uh, Hepburn and Miller Mills, played well um, in the uh, in the Welsh game when they came on. I actually thought they, they won a scrum penalty, um, and they were pretty good in the loose. So I'm quite happy with them as replacements, um, and I think probably they should just stay in there unless. Uh, you know, I don't think Nell should maybe come in over them as much as I love Nell and I always will love Nell. I think it's Miller Mills is maybe going to give a be there for a bit longer. Uh, second row, actually, uh, really disappointed we lost Richie Gray. Uh, I think I, I still don't understand why he was out of the Scotland squad for so long um, before this, but now that he's been playing, I'm really disappointed we miss, we lost him because our lineup really does go to mince when we've not got him. Uh, and I thought Grant Gilchrist coming in, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm no big Grant Gilchrist fan. I thought he played a really decent game against France um, and was carrying well, he was making tackles, he was martial in the lineup. The lineup was great until until basically yeah, later on, we didn't really have many mistakes. Um, I was a bit disappointed. I, I thought he was pretty good. Back row... I think um, Darge was outstanding in the France game uh, and I'm glad they brought him back in. I was worried because I always worry when you bring a player straight from injury back into squad, but he was outstanding, um, absolutely brilliant. Dempsey I thought was great. I think Xander Fagerson, um is really off the boil. Uh, not Xander, Matt Fagerson is off the boil. I, I, I mean, he basically was, he, he was what cost us the first French try. Because he, um, I, I don't know what happened with that carry, but he didn't stay on his feet long enough. He didn't he present the ball, and we lost it, um, which led to to France scoring. He just didn't look dominant to me um, in the two games. He's looked a bit slow. Uh, I think I would bring Christian to start against England, and I think I'd bring Richie back into the bench. Um, I think you're a little bit more experienced coming off the bench um, you could argue for a 6-2 I'll uh, go into that in a minute but I think we I think those in terms of the forwards um, their back row dynamic it was it was definitely better actually when Christie came on in the second half the, as I say we were pretty like we weren't giving France anything until a beautiful piece of individual skill from, from Bill Berry um, so we can't really sit there and complain that we weren't defending well uh, in, in, in the second half. So I think the, the back row was excellent. Uh, White and Russell are obviously going to retain their place, and I think Tuoplotto and Jones uh, are going to retain their place as well. Uh, Duhan's going to retain his place. He actually, weirdly, was defensively pretty darn decent in this game. The um, only thing I would say is he got way too narrow for Fiku's try, but everyone was too narrow, so... Um, there's not much we can really really say about that. In terms of uh, the back three, that's going to be interesting because I think Kinghorn's going to be fit. I'm not sure there's some chat that D Darcy Graham might be fit. Kyle Stain will presumably be available again um, following the, the the birth of his, his child and, and congratulations um, to, to him and his wife. Uh, so... You, you, but Kyle Rowe played pretty well um, as well it, it's, it's a tough spot for, for, for Tooney I think um, but I wanted to just focus on one thing um, obviously in this game Kyle Stain went out uh, in the France game Kyle Stain went out due to um, his, his wife going into labour and uh, and as I say congratulations to him and we, young Harry Patterson came in which was shocking to me because I thought they would have maybe brought in you know, moved Jones to full back and brought 
Cammy Redpath in or or something like that. I actually thought that um, Harry Patterson was brilliant um, against France. I, I, I wouldn't give him a 10 out of 10. There was a couple of wee things. He, he probably pushed up too quickly on Bill Berry's try, which led to there being a big space for him to kick into. But he, he, he was good under the high ball. He, he took most of the high balls. There was a couple of times where he was challenged. He um, won the ball back when uh, Russell done the short kick to, to get us going again. Um, he also uh, he also made his tackles. He made some good runs. He was ha- he made the right decision um, for the try uh, that we got in terms of setting up. He was very mature, um, and I know this is going to maybe upset Glasgow fans, but I actually think that he uh, Harry Patterson may be the man um, to be the sort of deputy to Kinghorn. Um, over John, over Smith, because his performance was really mature. Um, now, it's one game. Smith had several games, but I just can't get Smith against Ireland out of my mind with how immature he was. Um, and I think you know, Patterson out of all the fullbacks we've had looked really, really um, assured under the high ball. That said, I think Kinghorn probably should come straight back in. Um, and I think, you know, the other wing uh, is going to be interesting. I, I, if Darcy's fit, I think maybe you put him in, on the bench and you have, uh, and you keep Kyle Rowe in or you, you bring Kyle Stain in. It, it's quite difficult because I think all the back row when they when they played, they played pretty well. Um, it, It's a tough one, the back three. Uh, so not the back row, the back three. Um. And I, I, I think it's good that we've got all these options. It's not the kind of so-and-so and question mark anymore that we're worried about. We've got Patterson, we've got Smith. Um, you know, I'm not writing Smith off. I just think that Patterson maybe is going to be slightly better for Scotland all in. Um, and I think we're 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 looking good in that in that position. Um, against England, as I say, I think probably the same. Somebody said same starting fifteen. Uh, with Christie instead of Fagerson, I think that was the Scottish Rugby Pod uh, uh, or blog that said that. And uh, maybe um, we'd query whether or not Darcy, Kyle, Stain, um, and Kinghorn come back <laughs> in some shape or form. Um, and uh, it's a starting 15. Now, I just want to talk briefly about the bench because um, I know you've listened to me for a while if you're still here. Our bench has someone who is a waste of a bench spot on it. Uh, I've said this on Twitter and people have disagreed with me, but Ben Healy being on the bench for Scotland, if they're not going to play him, if they have no intention of playing him when it's tight, because they won't. I mean, if the game is tight and we're winning, they're keeping Finn on. If the game is tight and we're losing, they're keeping Finn on. Unless the game is miles out of reach or were miles ahead they're not bringing um, Ben Healy on for a, a cap um, the only time he's coming on is if Finn, Finn gets injured or red carded or something um, or if um, we or if we're, we're getting pumped or if we're, we're miles ahead so I do think that our bench dynamic needs to be looked at. If we've got people like Hutchinson, Hutchinson and Redpath who can cover 10, we're going to have Kinghorn back, presumably, for the next game. I think there's every chance that um, Ben Healy is dropped out of the, the 23, um, having not had a cap yet in the Six Nations, despite being on the bench twice, um, because he's just not going to be... No one's going to take Finn's place. Finn's going to play 80 minutes every game unless we're miles ahead. So maybe he comes in for the Italy game in the hope that we'll be bonus point tries and miles ahead by whatever time. But uh, no, sorry more about that. There's no necessity for um for Healy to be taking that spot, which is why I'm saying that you could either do a 6-2 where you, you have Richie and you maybe have a Bayless or a, or, or Matt Fagerson as your back row cover on the, on the bench. Um, it really could have Skinner and... Glenn, L- Glenn Young, um, c- who can cover six and, and um, second row, uh, as well as maybe a Richie or, or whatever. Um, or you could have 
Horn, Redpath, Kinghorn, Horn, Redpath, Darcy, Horn, Redpath, Kyle Steen, and you have you know different options that can change the game in different ways um, later on. If you're gonna if you're gonna do um, if you're not gonna play them, so yeah. I'm sorry for Ben Healy. I, 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 I like him as an Edinburgh player. Um, I know some people have doubted him. I do think Edinburgh made the wrong choice sending Savala off to Northampton um, on loan um, because essentially um, it means that we're now relying fully on Healy or we've got the young lad, um, Cammy Scott, who is, well, a young lad. Um, and I do think that it would be nice to have Savala still as an option. Um, but that being said... Uh, I don't know why Scotland have him on the bench if there is no intention to play him. And I know somebody said to me, well, I don't want a 10 that can come on in a pinch if Finn goes down in 10 minutes. Yeah, if Finn goes down in 10 minutes, though, our whole game plan is going to change anyway. So it doesn't really matter who you bring on in 10. Like, our whole game plan relies around Finn. Um, creating magic, kicking the corners, like, creating all these, these moments that he creates. So if Finn goes down, it doesn't really matter who comes in at 10. You could put... Pierre Schoeman at 10, it's not really going to make much of a difference um, right now until we either are confident that we've got a 10 that can come in and try and play a similar style or a 10 who's going to come in and maybe change the style that we're confident can that style is, is going to successfully work. If we don't have that, then we'd as well have an extra other back back cover and just go in for it. So anyway, that's my opinion. Um so uh, yeah, starting starting line up against France. Um, for me, exactly the same fifteen, uh, with except exactly the same pack with the exception of Christie over Fagerson. Um, Fagerson drops out and Richie goes on the bench, and um, the backs uh, exactly the same up to the back three with uh, Kinghorn's fit. I think he comes in at full back. Um, I think possibly Kyle Steen takes Kyle Rose's position and Rowe either drops the bench or out. And Darcy, Darcy Graham, if he's fit, goes on the bench. That's it for me. I think Cammy Redpath moves to 22 and we just drop um, Healy out altogether. Anyway, uh, I've waffled enough. I'm, I'm still angry about yesterday. Uh, I'm sure you are too. Um, but we need to look at bigger picture here. We need to be reflective and we need to say, actually, what our team are putting on tape is not good enough um, to win anyway. Um, and it's not just about the referee, and they shouldn't, have, you know, we shouldn't be leaving it to a referee to make a decision when the clock's in the red. Simple as that. Anyway, onwards and upwards. We've got England next. We can get the Calcutta Cup. We can retain that. will be, I think, the longest strip we've retained it in a long time. Um, so hopefully we do that. Hopefully we're you know here two weeks time celebrating uh, a, a nice re retention of the Calcutta Cup. Looking forward to Italy and then possibly a triple crown decider with Ireland. Hopefully. Uh, keep our chins up. Thanks for listening. Cheers.